You're listening to The Vent Podcast, where we bring you interviews and stories from around the world of wine and spirits. From winemakers and critics to sommeliers and master distillers, we'll explore the people and businesses who are instrumental in shaping the future of today's food and drinks culture. Enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Vent Podcast. My name is Brady, joined back in studio by Billy Galanko. How are you doing, Billy? Very well today. Excited for our interview, but also we're recording this before the long weekend. So also excited for a long weekend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, we have a, a new guest on. I know we last couple of episodes, we've had some uh, repeat guests on and done some archived episodes, but we have a brand new guest today, Matthew Kaner, and he's someone that you've been following for a little bit now and definitely shares your LA wine scene vibe. Yeah. You know, he, he lives in my neighborhood turns out which is cool but i don't think that's an accident i followed him so we'll get into it but he used to own one of the my favorite wine bars here so i have a little story about that in the podcast where i tell him and then yeah he introduced me via his som tv blind tastings to christy norman who we've also had on here but who i also got to know through the la som group which i joined because of hers yeah no he's been a really interesting Force in the LA wine scene and one that I've followed a lot of the places he's worked or helped open are places I frequent. So it was pretty cool to be able to talk to him. But another small twist of fate here, when I was in Australia, the general or I guess the chief winemaker at the winery I worked at was used to be like the general manager for all of Penfold's white wines. So he had between him and this other guy who had worked in the industry for a while, they had connections all over Australia. So when I went tasting in the Barossa, one of the places I went was this place called Sepulsfield. And it's one of the most historic wineries in Australia. It's one of the oldest ones they have. And I guess not many people know this, but during it wasn't just during the Depression, but there was a, a big economic downturn in the Barossa Valley where people were actually like, all the wineries were closing, kind of vines were just left to be just due to various factors. So Sepulsfield actually was like a wealthy family and they had some other money from sources so they were actually able to hire people so it was really interesting you drive there and there are like these palm trees down both sides and basically they were just like trying to find random jobs for people in the community to do to keep everybody going which was neat so we i visited it's a historic winery they actually have still to this day like gravity fed like wine production tanks so fermentation tanks like they start at the very top and then they'll drain mm -hmm. it down to another one and it's pretty neat so why am i telling you all this <laughs> it turns out matthew Kaner had gone there as well and he, one of his most memorable wines, even before going there, an impetus for him to go there was a 1931 Sepults Field. Like it was one of their, their more fortified wines, I think he said. Which was interesting because I actually have a bottle of that. I don't know if it's the exact wine that he tasted. Mine, I realize mine is the Para Liqueur 1931, but it was uh, going to be the special bottle I brought home from Australia. And I was going to have it, um, you know, seven years from now when it was 100 years old. But the main reason was when I got to actually visit the winery while we were there, they keep, and he mentions this in the podcast, they keep one cask from every year with the goal of tasting it in a hundred years and they bottle it. They'll bottle it along the time, but then they'll also keep it for a hundred years. So I actually got to taste the 1918 vintage while we were there as well, which was really wow. cool. Wow. So like their current release is whatever one was hundred years old. I'm actually taking a look on their site now. Yeah, so if he had the Para one, like I had, they, they'll bottle those ones earlier and have the vintage on it, where they have a special cask that they will release on its 100th birthday. They might release a couple of the other ones earlier, but they keep at least one for the full 100 years. Yeah, the oldest one I see on the site right now, just like on their normal like retail part of their site, is the 1999. So I assume you can get the much older stuff by getting in touch or going there. Yeah, going there and then... I think I bought my old bottle. There was like a specialty shop in Melbourne that had gotten one in ages. So yeah, that's it. I think it's still in my parents' house somewhere. I actually have, I have the same wine from like the 90s here somewhere. So I should show you. Nice. Yeah. All, all of that runs with the theme of talking about some of the themes of his early restaurants that included, or restaurants, wine bars. They included a focus with a partner who was really into vintage wines. We talk a good bit about that in the episode. Yeah, like our other, like Chrissy and our other LA or West Coast wine people, super connected to like wine community and wine culture in the area. So yeah, he's definitely someone who's really well connected and has had a number of opportunities to open really cool restaurants 
earlier in the 2000s. And I think just got out of a few of those based on what he was telling us offline in terms of his ownership. But yes. moving on. It's, it, mm-hmm. In the last five years. But yeah, I think a couple of things you mentioned that were interesting is one, he opened a vintage wine bar and then you really know you're on the West Coast when he's like, yeah, a lot of our bread and butter was Napa and Sonoma, which yeah. m- a lot of the rest of the country doesn't, it's not synonymous with vintage. But I'd like to get your perspective on this as well as in my mind, a wine with some age on it. This might be just because I'm my my budget and my perspective on wine. But I think after 10 years, certain wines start to develop and and then really prestigious wines can continue to develop well for 20, 30, 40 years. But the way he was talking about vintage wine is it was like he'd be like, oh, yeah, this vintage wine was good, but it's like exclusively like 30 or 40 years. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, oh, you're talking about like very old wines. I thought that was very yeah. interesting. Yeah, I kept using the word vintage, which I guess that's like what I would say or how I would describe those wines. But I was thinking about vintage. That's even like in the formal sense of the way that we usually use vintage would be like 25 years plus, I think. Right. Like so maybe he has that. I'm not sure if he has that in mind. <laughs> maybe he does. <laughs> but yeah, definitely talked a lot. He talked about like the 1950, 1955 DRC or like the Lafitte from 1899 or something like that. It's just, yeah, you definitely have to shift your perspective on why am I like opening and tasting this bottle of wine right now? It's probably not to explore the nuances of the terroir. <laughs> it's definitely as like a memento of history at that point. Yeah, I think the way it develops sometimes. It, <laughs> yeah, well, the way some things develop is terroir. But no, he has a really interesting saying at the very end of the podcast. I'll have everybody, I won't try to spoil it here, about like appreciating an aged wine for its history and kind of mm-hmm. what, what it's gone through in its life. I, I thought that was really interesting. But yeah, no, to your point, when your perspective, when you do taste many wines that are close to 100 years old or more, I guess that does put your thing. But I think some people in the industry, they'll refer to one to five years old. It's like new release or the latest release is whatever the newest one is. And then you'll say back vintage for ones that are 10 plus years. So maybe vintage is just, I'm tired of saying back all the time, but you won't say back vintage. Yeah, I guess that's not like a, in my cellar, I won't say back vintage. Well, if I'm referring to a specific producer or a specific bottle, I'll say back vintage to refer to anything that isn't new release. If I'm asking, I guess that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so one year. And it really depends on the wine too, because some people say their wine's entering their drinking window. So I guess in my mind, I'm starting to think of aged wines as like the beginning of their drinking window. But I do forget that, especially on a lot of these wines, you can drink it within 10 to 15 years to start to see development. But they're, they will say on even like wine searchers, like drinking window is 2025 through 2075. <laughs> it's okay. Well, I guess that is, and it evolves. So, yeah, I guess what that means is that drinking window is it's old enough that some of those young and abrasive characteristics have blown off. And then on the back end of it, it's this isn't so oxidized that it's unpalatable. I guess that's what that range is. I don't really know. It's 15, 25 to 75 years is pretty broad range. Yeah, I know that the beginning... So the beginning, I guess it's when, in theory, when a wine starts to just show its distinct character. And to your point, that's driven by like terroir and the producer and and stuff like that. So in theory, those characteristics are starting to come out and blossom to a point. And I think a lot of people are looking for that balance of fruit meets character. And it's like, where on the spectrum, how much development do you want um, is, is completely subjective. And he talks about that. So I think that also has to do for the range but it is interesting to think and i love and again he'll talk he'll, he talks about it more but it's like just talking thinking about the history of that specific bottle or like thinking about the experience of tasting it not necessarily going in for i want this to be the most tasty thing like from a purely like palate point of view it's more of just like an experience and really appreciating it for what it is i think that was that's really cool yeah no definitely yeah, I think it has good perspective on the vintage wine stuff. And most people like aren't drinking super old wines. And if they do, they're maybe having a handful a year. And yeah, definitely for most people, their palate would have to be recalibrated to appreciate most of the characteristics you would get from a 80-year-old wine. Well, yeah, that old, but 
to yeah. talking about 80. He's, he's talking 25, 30, yeah, I have 40. A, I had a 2015 Sonoma Syrah the other day and I opened it and I like wasn't expecting for all the fruit to be like gone. And it was, and it was just surprising and like off putting because it wasn't what I was expecting. What do so, you mean gone? It was, first of all, it tasted way more oxidized than or what's the word flat less lively than i expected from something that was just nine years old but maybe that's old Mm. for like a it's a single variety syrah from sonoma i don't know maybe you can tell me is that old? (laughs) might have been an off bottle it shouldn't be it shouldn't be what was the producer do you mind me asking well i wouldn't say the producer but it was like a single vineyard small producer kind of thing and I was just expecting it to be like still like voluptuous and ripe in terms of its fruit character- characteristics. And it definitely wasn't. Yeah. Well, I guess that it, in that case, I guess it comes down to winemaking and when they picked. So in theory yeah. to hit, and he mentions, Matt mentions it on the call. It's like it, it, you need acid, tannin and or sugar to age well. Sometimes alcohol mm-hmm. helps too. So if it was a really ripe vintage and not only the ripeness eliminated all the acid, but also the way that they made it. Like again, maybe it was a low extraction style and very little tannin that could have attributed to it. Could be in the winemaking. Yeah, uh, I, 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 mentioned, yeah. I mentioned that just to really say that like what I was expecting from the bottle and what I got was different and it made the experience like less memorable or pleasant. And so I feel like a lot of people who come to... uh if they try a wine with some age on it, I'm talking more than nine years, but try some wine with age on it and they haven't been drinking many of those wines in the past, they might have, they might not have a reference point for what they're about to experience. And it like be part of the reason why people can be iffy about whether or not they like those wines. That's all. Oh, certainly. Yeah. That's where, is this how it's supposed to taste? Is it not like that, that thing, like actually having, and that's where like he was saying again, wine tasting and having actual mentors and people walk you through and be like, this is what it's supposed to taste like. This is good is basically the only way to learn in the wine business when it comes to that type of, or the wine, drinking wine. I will say one one funny side note on a wine about the same age. We were cooking this week. We made some braised lamb shank and we needed red wine. And the only ones I had open were still from studying in the fall for fortified exam. So I asked me, I was like, can I just use these? One is actually, they have these random Vendu Natural things at K&L. So it's like a 1983, 1985, like fortified <laughs> French wine that you can buy for 40 bucks. I don't know why they have it. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I was like, it's only like off dry. It's not that sweet. But me, it was like, no, that'll be too much sugar. So I like scrounged around and the crappiest bottle I could find in my house was like a 2015 Syrah cab, um, like San Giovese, like super Tuscan. So I haven't tried it yet, but I poured it into the thing to make the braise the lambs. It smelled good. So that still had life. So maybe that's a good reference for you. I, I put the cork back in right away, hoping it'll open up a little bit. That was three days ago. So I'll try it again today and uh, see what happens. But that was the lamb good? Similar vintage Syrah. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually better than I expected. I'm not as big into like really lamby lamb, like gamey lamb. So for me, it was balanced. May really likes lamb more. So it was more a dish for her. And I was just going to eat it because. I wanted to cook something she liked, but it was good. Yeah, I was very happy with it. So it's a tricky meat to cook. So congrats, you good job on that. Oh, yeah, we normally, yeah. <laughs> but cool. Well, anyways, so we'll get back off of the food and talk. I will report back on that 2015 Syrah. And yes. yeah, so here is our interview with Matthew Kaner. Again, he is, he does everything. He started out, he said he was born and raised working and then he worked in a restaurant in Santa Barbara. He moved down mm-hmm. to Los, yeah, down to Los Angeles. And then once he was here, he worked at one of these iconic wine shops that's near me right now. And then he opened a bunch of different wine bars, both here and sounds like he had a, a place in Palm Springs as well. And then he transitioned into consulting. So now he travels around being an ambassador for different wine regions. He consults for wine programs around the country that are trying to open. He also represents the consumer and helps consult for bigger wineries, giving a perspective of what's going on the ground for different wineries. And then he also is now writing in the column for the Men's Journal. 
And yeah, he has his hands in a bunch of things. So I hope everybody enjoys this interview with Matt Kaner. All right, we are here with Matthew Kaner. Thank you so much for joining today. Happy to be here. What's up? Yeah, so I think I might have told you, but for our listeners, I think I might have told you in our intro kind of emails. But when I first moved to LA, it's been a little over five years now, I actually picked my apartment to be a, like walking distance to multiple wine bars and Covell, which you were a former owner of was and you were owner at the time was one of those wine bars. And actually the day that my dad and I drove out here, the very first place we went after we like stopped at our Airbnb, my first like LA place, we went to Covell like immediately. Wow. So wow. Amazing. Thanks Thank for you. creating that place. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Pleasure. Honestly. Yeah. Matthew, as you as we would have like intro now, you have such a diverse background. You've done so many things in the wine world. Do you want to just tell everybody, walk us through your journey and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, of course. Thank you again for having me. Happy to be here to talk with you guys, tell my story a bit. Um, I started off, um, I was brought up in Santa Barbara. So having a wine, you know, now a very legitimate on the world stage wine region in my backyard was inspiring from a young age. I went to college there. I was managing a barbecue restaurant and one of my college roommates, his father was a big wine collector. So he started showing me from a young age, some really incredible wines, which inspired me to quit my restaurant job and get a gig in a wine store back in 2005. Crazy to think next year will be 20 years. And that was really where the inspiration started. I, it was a conglomeration of all my real big passions in life, geography, history, storytelling, I love smelling and tasting things. I'm a big fan of food. I love to eat. So wine just made a lot of sense. Then you talk about geology and things like that, that are, you're just always learning. The goalposts always moving on what you can find out and how we can, with geo dating and carbon dating and things that people are able to do now, you just continue to learn new aspects of how things are formed. And for me, that blew my mind that I could always have this kind of lifetime of knowledge ahead of me. Santa Barbara, Lived there for another about a year and a half after moved to LA. And I didn't mention I was trying to be a singer, songwriter, sad bastard, guitar guy. I moved to LA trying to do that. And I ended up having to get a job as it happens. I was the second employee at Silver Lake Wine. Very luckily, perfect timing. I lived in Silver Lake. They were around the corner. And that's, that's where cool. I learned about community. Truly. That was the start of that. Nice. I, I live in Silver Lake now and I'm very familiar. I'm on the other side, closer to Echo Park, but that's really nice. Cool. Yeah, I'm in Silver Lake so, also myself. I'm right by the reservoir, so we're not far off. Oh, nice. We should could have done it in person. I didn't even think ah, to ask. Next time. <laughs> yeah. So from there and building that community, did that kind of immediately kickstart more of a, a focus in selling wine on the retail side? Or did you know you always wanted to do a little bit of hospitality stuff and this was like getting your educational feet wet? I had no idea that owning a business, having a new place you could open, I just wasn't thinking like that. I was a little bit more right in front of me rather than down the road. And then I had a really chance meeting with someone who became a business partner and a big inspiration in my life. My, my still friend, though we're not business partners anymore, my friend Dustin Lancaster, who came into Silver Lake Wine one day looking for a specific bottle of wine, one that it was like chance and so rare that he was looking for that specific thing because there was nowhere else he was going to find it, literally. It was a wine called Le Maurier by a winemaker in Minervois, Languedoc area called Luc Le Père. So he's looking for this wine. This mm. is back in 2007. No one knew what it was. We had a relationship with the importer. So we had almost an exclusive, let's say. It turned out he had it like maybe a year before that. They had it at a restaurant he worked at called Cafe Stella, still a seminal restaurant in the Silver Lake area. And it started this friendship. I literally asked him, how the fuck do you even know what that is? Like point blank to his face. It, that's how I am. I, I shock people sometimes like that. I do it on purpose. It's fun. You get people out of their comfort zone. <laughs> My parents get mad at me because I curse too much. But the thing is, it gets people, either you're going to find that people hate the cursing or it's going to make them more comfortable. And if they don't like it, they can fuck off. No offense. But I've learned these moments happen and you've got to be aware of their significance. And I call them line in the sand moments. There was literally everything before that moment. And then now everything after with some time, 16 years later, I can say truly it changed my life because we opened Covell together. He came to me and said, I'm sick of making money for someone else. I don't know. I want to do my own business. I'm thinking a wine bar. And then he said, I'm not going to do it unless you do it with me. 
And it opened up this new mentality of, well, wow, we can really do what we want to do. And there's things to be done outside of the everyday. It's easy to show up to work. There's security and having a paycheck. The money's coming every two weeks. I just wasn't really a risk assessor back then. I just said, fuck it, let's go. Let's figure it out. And we did. We got lucky. But opening Covell was very eye-opening. Getting it physically open was very hard. The, it was took us, I think, nine months, which that's not that long. Nowadays, I have friends that are taking multiple years. But back then, you're thinking, well, I'm going to go bankrupt before we ever open the doors. We got to get open and make some money. Uh, but yeah, we just, I don't know, it was the right time. There was no real wine bars doing what we were doing or other people's words. We were the first wine bar in LA, apparently. So it's, it's one of those things like, we had no clue what we were really doing or what sort of imprint it might have. We just knew it was right for us because Dustin had his kind of collection and community of people that would go hang out with him at Stella. He was known for that. I had people who trusted my palate and would come into Silver Lake Wine and let me put together like a case of wine for them, or they had a certain dinner they needed a bottle for, or they needed a gift. I had my own people who trusted me and liked my palate. So we were lucky that we had like a following, let's say. And we had no clue. We were maybe prepared for 10 people a day. And the first day we opened, I think 350 people came. They just don't know. Wow. That's incredible. Did you have a, did you have a line in the sand moment? Like going back to when you first really got introduced to wine with your buddy's dad, was there something that he first introduced to you then where you were like, wow, like I just didn't know that this existed. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Of all the things that Ron Green opened for me, and he opened some unbelievable wine, the one that got my attention the most was a 1931 Sepultsfield port style wine from South Australia. And what's so crazy about that, he ended up giving me a bottle, like probably the last third of it. And port style wines, they have, depending on the year and how they were made, they've got like a four to six week shelf life once they're open. So I was like proud to have been given this and I tried to taste all my friends on. I was very excited to share it. I've since gone back to Sepultsfield in 2018. I got to go back to the winery and they still have in barrel all their top vintages. And when I told the story to the general manager, he let me try it out of cask just to have this like memory to bring up the old memories. So yeah, 31 Sepultsfield. Wow. And when we were there in 2018, I guess the, I think it was Prince William and his wife, Kate had just been there. So they were really excited. There was just a lot of attention on South Australia at that moment. And yeah, so like of all, he would open like Grand Cru Burgundies from the seventies and we drank Armagnac from the 1800s and Madeira from the 1800s. And I'm, I could go on and on, but it's unbelievable the access I had when I had no clue what it was. So yeah, that's, oh, sorry, Brady. I was gonna say two, two quick things. One that's, we've heard many people have friends or like friends' parents introduce them to things, but they're normally in the UK and it's normally not to that extent. And two, very <laughs> small world. I worked a vintage in Australia in 2018 and actually went to Sepultsfield as well and got to taste there. They had their 1918 available there, but I also, I went wow. back in, in Melbourne. I was actually able to buy a bottle of the 1931. I was like, this is going to be the one prize thing I have. It's actually still at my parents' house, not here. Wow. So that's crazy that you actually had that exact, exact wine. So that's crazy. Yeah, it's and I would have had one of the few bottles brought to the U.S. This was 06 that that bottle came to me. So yeah, w small world indeed. That's crazy. Like you said, you were tasting some pretty crazy stuff. Did you, and you did that from a young age, what was your trajectory in terms of exploration like after that? And what was the, I'm not a LA guy, now on the West Coast, so can give, the, give me and the listeners a sense of what the strategy and what were you trying to bring folks attention to when you first opened that yeah wine bar? well so to quickly go back the my retail history you know having these wines these like revelatory red letter day bottles and then i started to work at a wine fa uh, world famous wine store that had one of the biggest collections of burgundy bordeaux big time focus in piemonte so barolo barbaresco just incredible seller and then Silver Lake Wine was more about new up and coming hip boutique wines. So I had a balance of the different knowledge bases. When we opened Covell, we opened with a mindset of we're not going to have a wine list because no one knows how to speak all these fucking 10 languages people read from the price to the left side where the actual information is. They don't even look at wine lists a lot of times. People don't know what they're looking for. And I don't want to say it. the trade obviously knows and people who are wine 
aficionados know, but that's 10% of people who are out drinking wine. So what we aim to do was first off, separate the fact that you're not there to read, fuck a fucking wine list. It's not what it's for. That takes away some of the enjoyment and let's use our words and get to the heart of what we're trying to enjoy here. And so it allowed us to have wines from places that were not obvious. Like 2010, it was still early to have wines from the Republic of Georgia and from Croatia and Slovenia. And I was, I'm a big fan of South African wine. And, you know, I'm, we're not the first people to have South African wine, obviously, but in LA, you didn't really find it. You, you maybe would see someone who had a Pinotage or had been to South Africa. So they got inspired to have something, maybe like a Grand Beck sparkling wine, but there wasn't a lot of South African wine in LA at that point. And I was a big fan of Australian wine. I remember pouring Hunter Valley Sem by the glass. People were like, what the fuck is this? They didn't know what it was. It was fun to turn people onto that. So the whole thing was separate yourself from whatever grape you think you like. Uh, I know you like Pinots and Malbecs. That's an easy thing for everyone to go around saying because they're wines everyone has. But what about the other 6,000 varieties out there that maybe you don't know how to pronounce? And this might be the most inspiring story you've ever heard. So the whole thing was, let's help people learn the wine vernacular. Let's actually make it better so when they go to other places, they can better ask for what they're looking for. It became a community service in a way. And people just loved and. Don't get me wrong. We had haters too. There were people who came in and were like, what do you mean you don't have a wine list? I know you're hiding it. Give me the wine list. And I have to explain like, there's literally not a wine list because it's a waste of my time to print a wine list here. We were selling like hundreds of wines and every day we would sell out of something. For the first three years, I did not reorder a single wine, not one for three full years. I would have wasted so much ink and paper and I just wasn't willing to waste my time doing that. I was busy doing other stuff. It was crazy. I don't recommend it. Don't open a place without a wine list. Anyone out there listening? Well, I was going to say, I'm <laughs> sure you, I was actually about the comment. That actually sounds like a nice way to do it from just management inventory perspective is you don't have to worry about, oh, what are we low on? What do we need to reorder? You just buy whatever you want. And when it's gone, that's cool. Yeah. There was a lot of yeah. creature comforts I created for myself. Well, I'd get there at 9 a.m. and I wouldn't leave till 2 a.m. So I didn't want to make more work for myself. It was already hard enough. I'm sure your distributors loved when you didn't reorder as well, or whoever yeah. you bought from. <laughs> <laughs> I had to train them that way. It like, doesn't mean I'm not going to order from you anymore, but I'm not going to have that wine. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 the first three years, we were out to prove something. We were, we really wanted people to have a new experience and try something different. And Dustin created an environment that people loved. He, on top of being the, the primary owner, and he, now he has 15 places, maybe more, but he also designs them and his aesthetic the way he creates a room for people to enjoy it on top of what we were serving, where it was being served was very important. And just the environment he created was special. Nice. Nice. And so you also were instrumental in opening Augustine too, with kind of more of that traditional side to Covell's pushing forward more. Uh, can you, yeah. you want to explain a little bit about what, what that was too? Yeah. Uh, so Dustin and I both had a friend who separately, we knew him. We realized later that we both knew him. It's our friend, Dave Gibbs, who's a musician, singer, songwriter, guitar player, bass player. He, for years, had a, a songwriting career, was in a band called the Gigolo Ants. He plays with Tom Morello and all the different versions of his bands, did the music for Josie and the Pussycats and That Thing You Do. And he's got just a bunch of stuff Dave has done. Avid wine collector and one of the most like academic wine aficionados that I know. He's the kind of person... I used to be like this when I had time, but he would, if, his, if he was interested in something, he would learn every single detail to the minutia of the etymology, where it came from, how it happened. And I'm telling you, like, he would know the clothes that certain winemakers' wives would buy, like couture shit. It's just crazy oh, wow. where his mind goes, the rabbit holes he goes down. And he would come bring wines to us. Like, he'd open, we'd have a 50s DRC and be like, hey, you, want, you guys want to try this? We actually had a no outside wine policy at Covell just because... Like you don't bring a steak to a steakhouse and ask the chef to cook it. Same with a wine bar with 150 wines by the glass. It doesn't really make sense to bring your own wine there. But when Dave would show up, we'd be like, you know what? Fuck it. As long as you don't mind sharing. Sure. And it created this kind of environment of vintage wine. He was really proud of vintage wine. So he wanted us to open a Covell. He and his wife had lived in like Los Feliz Silver Lake area for a long time. And then they moved to Sherman Oaks and he lamented the lack of cool places. There's no wine here. And you guys would crush it if you open a Covell. And 
we kind of, Dustin and I looked at each other, that's not our neighborhood. Like it's not where we spend time. It's not our people. We weren't necessarily against it, but it didn't make sense. So Dave had a couple different times coming in being like, you really should do it. And I, I think after about the fourth time of hearing that, I go, and this is again, how I am. I go, well, if it's such a good idea, why the fuck don't you open the wine bar in Sherman Oaks? I said it just like that. And I think he got the idea that maybe he could do it. So he went into looking into the process and realized it's not a one man or a one person job, but you need a team. So he had asked Dustin if Dustin would be involved and Dustin advocated for my involvement as well, which I, I'm forever thankful for. And we together, all three of us partnered on doing the mindset was to open a Covell inspired wine bar, but for the Sherman Oaks neighborhood, which is all the people in Silver Lake. Los Feliz Echo Park, who are like up and coming people, so much art, music industry, entertainment industry, architects, people who are at some point going to be someone if they're not already. Well, all their fucking bosses live in Sherman Oaks and they've all been someone and they've all got a lot more money and they spend it. So we knew that and we took that to heart. We opened a little bit higher end experience with Dave's kind of mindset of having vintage wine available. And when we first started, we were selling a lot of his personal collection, which was crazy. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's, it's very different. It truly really changes, one, the way that you present the wines, but also who, who you're able to engage when you're having like younger, newer, maybe fresher wines versus vintage wines. What was the demographic yeah. like, aside from one group has more money to spend than the other? Was yeah. uh, the group at this new place maybe just like further along generally in their wine journey? And so like they had a palate to appreciate the vintage stuff. Or like, how was that divided? Yeah. So Sherman Oaks, just as a, like the background of the neighborhood, it's like people who have a Valley view and live up in the hills and have a nice house and probably have a little more money. But that said, like they all would be the kind of people that would entertain at home and probably knew top end wine. So there was a lot of familiarity with obviously top Napa producers, Bordeaux. They knew if the wine spectator was writing about it, they knew about it kind of thing. Without going too, I don't want to be too general, but I noticed a shift. A lot of people who live in the, the Silver Lake East Side area, at some point, there's a lack of inventory of homes over here. And if you want to buy a house, you have to look to the valley. So a lot of people that I had known in my like Silver Lake wine pass ended up moving out to Sherman Oaks, Studio City, Encino, Valley Village, wherever. So we, we saw a little bit of an energy of that East Side like what happened with my partner, Dave, like he, he ended up making the move too. But what that brought was people who had learned or had a little bit of that first introduction to maybe like Austrian wine versus drinking Bordeaux Blanc. Like there, there was just a little bit more of an open mind in a lot of ways, but the people who were someone like they wanted to drink old Napa, old Bordeaux, old Burgundy, old Barolo, old Brunello de Maltocino. That's just, that's what people wanted. So we made that accessible and the one thing I learned, and I'm glad we listened because it was a tough lesson. Covell doesn't take reservations. You have to walk in. You got to fight for a spot. But at Augustine, we got so sick of hearing, when are you going to take reservations? I, I can't get a table. How are we supposed to fix this? There's a certain thing when you get agents calling and they're like, uh, yeah, Kevin Hart would like to come, but I hear you don't take reservations. We, we realized we had to start taking reservations there. So that was one of the few things we quickly made an adjustment on just because you're losing business at some point it was tough, but it was a small place and you could only accommodate so many people. But on the wine front, yeah, it just, it kept us really able to focus on vintage California, Napa and Sonoma being primary gold. Then a lot of Bordeaux, a lot of Tuscan, a lot of Piemonte, and then we pepper in cool stuff here and there too. But yeah, it was, it was really we wanted to be inspired, but we wanted the people who were coming to enjoy it. So we listened to what people had to say. On the, so from there, open your world to like, no, well, maybe it didn't, but you continued to open your world to different opportunities. You were on like Psalm TV and I, I saw you host some tastings there. I love your blind tasting episodes. I know you did some other stuff. So you want to talk about how you used that hospitality start and moved into some other realms? Yeah. So I became friends with the Psalm TV people. Obviously, I'd been a fan of the Psalm documentary. We all got to see that. Then when Psalm 2 was coming out, they invited us to the, the premiere. So I remember Dave and I from Augustine went to the premiere. And then shortly after that, the executives from Psalm TV started coming to Augustine more often. They lived in the Valley. And so we, we became friends. And then they started asking, like, would you 
allow us to use it as a filming location. Would you like to be in some episodes? It just was a quick segue like that. So about 2019, I started going on camera with them and it was fun as co actually when COVID happened was when I got more involved. We were doing a lot of things remotely and filming stuff at home, doing what it essentially would become voiceover and then they'd use it for whatever amazing views and other things they had filmed and, and maybe some shared footage they had from other crews they've hired throughout Europe. Then once we were able to get back and actually filming stuff, yeah, I was a, a host and producer for the network for a couple of years until 2022, made some really fun things with them. I'm really thankful for that time. I'm someone who had been trying to make TV shows in the wine world for a long time and kept hearing no. So it was really great to have an ability to use this creative outlet <clears throat> that I had felt tamped down and a little bit unfulfilled. And they gave me some latitude to, to help not only do my own stuff, my ideas, but also help massage some of their ideas. And one of which was the Sparklers TV show that we made together. It was really fun. So yeah, I, I was thankful for that outlet. It was great. Yeah, no, I think some of that, I, I guess my wine journey in LA actually is like slowly just following you around because I was watching one of your blind tasting things. And that was like the first time I had heard of Christy Norman. Yeah. And I reached out. So I joined the LA SOM group because of that. And then I, you've used the network to further my studies, which has been great. But when you were thinking about wine TV, because we've also had both Joe Fatterini and Amelia Singer from the wine show on with, I know you guys are friends. Um, yeah, Amelia and I are, but I don't know Joe, but Amelia and I, I love her. She's awesome. Yeah, know, yeah she was, yeah. she told us to say hi. I was only a few hi, episodes Amelia. ago. <laughs> she has to listen now. Anyways. I'll make sure. <laughs> how did you guys, did you guys talk at all about, like, we're both trying to do these like lifestyle or like wine TV shows that also resonate with a broader audience? Or were you trying to focus more just on the wine folks where they are trying to bring in more outside people. So I think as Jason and Christina and Jackson started to trust me more, they would let me give a little bit of information and kind of insider baseball kind of stuff. Like who's young and hip and who should we be focusing on kind of thing. It's interesting whenever you're trying to find the next, I don't know. It's like when you're looking for who might be the next big winemaker, you got to look at the assistant winemakers, the person behind the person, the seller masters. I was luckily really instrumental in being part of the neighborhood and part of the community in the wine world of LA. And Christy and I became friends. I really love the energy she brought to the table. You know, that was a quick, easy one to be like, this is someone the world should know. Let's put her out there. And then from there, we like, we just cross pollinated all of our networks. And so I think from the song, and I don't want to speak for some TV, but from their perspective, their whole thing was let's make great TV. Let's get great moments. So the fact that she and I were friends and were familiar and comfortable with each other for them was the most important thing. For me, it was, I knew that Christy and I would have a familiarity, but also challenge each other. And I knew our dynamic. And then I, I was able to bring in other friends from there, from whether they're wine people or celebrities or models, or it, we were just able to, again, cross pollinate our networks. What you learn in wine, especially with content. Wine as a niche is very small in the world. Network type people don't want to focus on it. Like I'm talking CBS, NBC, ABC. It's hard to get people like that to, to see the value in making a wine show because they think that it's such a small net, small marketing possibility. The advertisers are very small and something like Song TV, where they're not worried about that, they they get to tell the best stories and use their access to expose the right things. Right. And so. It was cool to be able to then start to bring in other people who maybe had a bigger reach and just yeah, it, like focusing on the wine itself is really cool for the trade. But if you're trying to grow your audience, you got to find ways to bring in, I don't know, a hip hop artist or a professional athlete or someone who's got a reach outside of wine, even if a lot of their people are now becoming wine aficionados, wine connoisseurs, wine lovers. And we've seen that, like what the NBA has been able to do. Fuck, it's unbelievable how wine has become so popular within that world. And we give the credit, obviously, the original D Wade, Chris, TP3, LeBron, when they were out in Miami, I forget what they called themselves. They had the something boat. Everyone knows that I forget off the top of my head, but like they started putting it on their Instagram and certain wines you couldn't get anymore because of it. Like that, that just fueled a whole new kind of cross section of why wine mattered. And I've had a bunch of NBA guys follow me on Instagram because of all this stuff with Som TV. It's crazy. They're all watching. So yeah, it's, there's a focus obviously on the trade and information, but 
you also got to get outside of it because how are we going to grow our networks? It's an everyday challenge I have of how to get other people to learn about it, not just the people who already know or already are knowledgeable. There's a show on some TV called Sparklers, right? That you were involved with and yeah. was a little bit more of, I don't know, like a reality, well, not, I wouldn't call it reality. It's all reality, but more of a reality show yep. type food Com- and wine. Competition. So, yep. Yeah. Competition. Exactly. Is that sort of a little bit of a flavor of that, of it seems like that format maybe is much more accessible to a broad audience versus these tasting sessions, which only people like us might tune into. Yeah, I think that was part of the thought process. Jason Wise, who's the main director and the most seminal voice at Psalm TV, he, I don't think I was the first person he said it to, but he came to me and said, I have this idea. I want to do a cooking competition show, which we all love cooking competition shows. But he goes, I want it to be focused on pairing with sparkling wine. I really want sparkling wine to be the focus. And he said that to the right person because I'm a sparkling wine fanatic. I love champagne. I love bubbles. I love I drink sparkling wine from all over the place. And I took it to heart. I told him, I look him right in the eye and I said, I'm going to fucking make this. We're going to make this. If you say that, just be prepared. It's going to get made. And we made it happen. It was one of those things like the cooking competition format breaks outside the wine mold, but then you bring in a wine element to then give the wine world a reason to tune in as well and to give it credence. Yeah, it was trying to accomplish all goals and be something bigger to more people. That's cool. I think, yeah, when we were talking to Amelia too, she's like also involved with a game show type format. Uh, yeah. For why, yeah. which is interesting. Yeah, um, the, the guy who won's an LA guy, I think. Yeah. All right. That's the first one. Yeah, no, there's, sounds like there's a, a lot that I need to catch up on that show. So from there in the Psalm TV stuff, you've pivoted now towards that then led you down to consulting and then also nowadays writing. Like what type of consulting were you doing? Were you helping people like build wine lists or was it styles of wine for wineries? What, what, what kind of things were that? Yeah, early on in the, the first, let's say five years of the wine bar world. So like 2010 to 2015, people would bring me in and I was careful how often I'd do it and I wouldn't let it interfere with my work. But People would ask me like, will you help me open a wine bar and do the wine program? Will you train our staff? Sometimes I'd help them reimagine or re-visualize a wine program for an existing space. That was early stuff. Then I started to get people offering, hey, the Loire Valley or the Rhone Valley wants to do an event. Would you be our LA partner, our ambassador for that event? Help get the guest list together, maybe do a seminar, that kind of thing. So that was happening early in my kind of wine bar career. And then I started to see a little bit bigger opportunities happen. Like I became an ambassador for a Cava brand for a couple of years. I've done some work with a brand in Oregon. Things like that started to happen. And I saw a little bit more potential. I didn't know it could be a focus. though. I just never thought that I could make a business out of that. And what it turned into was helping people open wine bars and restaurants, ambassador work for brands and regions, marketing campaigns, brand advisory helping people launch a brand, a direct consumer brand, or maybe something to go to market, helping make connections with like importers, distributors, people all over the United States, helping wineries in Europe find importers to the United States as well, or not just Europe, really anywhere in the world. So I've got this kind of multitude of things that I've helped people do depending on what's necessary. And it's funny, I have this conversation with people like I'm not focused. I don't have a focus. That's good and bad. And I think it's good for a lot of reasons because I can say yes to a group of potential things that people might need, but also at the same time, someone's like, what do you do? I I need five minutes to explain what I do. There's no elevator pitch for what I can do on this. It's a little crazy. But yeah, the consulting stuff has been great because I've been able to get outside my own norm and help. Like 2022, I got hired to, I was the LA consultant to do the, what's called the BBWO, the Barolo Barbaresco World Opening which is a huge event where they came to LA, took over for a week and basically rolled out the new vintages of Barolo and Barbaresco wines. And we had a trade element. We had a consumer element. We had a gala dinner. And I was their person in LA because they all lived in either Piedmont or New York. So things like that I've been able to do as well. Crazy. That's really neat. The, the consulting side of the business, it's, it helps that you already had a variety of experiences because you can you had so much experience in the consumer side and then you can bring that in working with brands and stuff like that your perspective yeah. on 
up and coming trends and what folks are looking for has to be, I would think, invaluable for a lot of, especially legacy brands. I'd like to believe so. <laughs> yeah. We've seen so many pivots like. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> there are really big brands that are, is domestically and abroad that have, I think, done a really good job at navigating some of the changes in the industry. We think of like Treasury, Wine Estates, and like e and I think, has done a good job at navigating that. And yeah, so it's definitely a huge need for folks to add a culture element to the a consulting world in the business. Totally. Yeah. I just hope what well, it looks like we're going to get back on track in 2024. But the one thing that's so tricky, what's making this all really hard is an inconsistency of message on is wine healthy or not. Yeah. And that, that little asterisk on our industry has like, it's made people gun shy to buy wine. It's made the younger generation much more likely to lean into sober October and dry January, which pisses off the wine world and pisses off yeah. beer and pisses off spirits. And what happens is these little details that sound insignificant when they're said, but it can trigger a pullback in a certain way that then like 2023 for me, consulting was really bad. It was mm. really bad because people in order to salvage their year, cut back on marketing spend. And I get it. I'm not mad at anyone. I totally understand. I hope we can get back to a place yeah. where like the guy who made the Blue Zone show, Dan Buettner, amazing journalist, incredible at what he does. He did this really good podcast with Wine Enthusiast about a week ago or 10 days ago. And what he said from his data, and this is someone whose data I trust because he's been doing it a long time. And he's I, obviously everyone's selling something, but what he's selling is something we can all buy, which is how do we live to 100? Like it's not that hard to agree. That's probably a possible po positive thing to listen. He said most of these places have people drinking two glasses of wine a day. If you are by eating a bean heavy diet, if you've got God in your life, if you have community you can rely on, if you're walking 10,000 steps and you drink two glasses of wine, all those things are true. You're not going to die at 40. Maybe you're not poisoning yourself like we are here in America with our food. Yeah. But I don't know. People don't want to hear it. They like tightly packed little nuggets of information that fit in a 18 word headline. And then they don't like to read the whole article because we all have a bandwidth issue. So the problem is we focus on whatever the headline is and that becomes the reality, which then ruins markets. I don't know. I don't know yeah. how we win on this, but it, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I have people on, on our investment side of the business sometimes ask, oh, isn't, aren't people not drinking wine and spirits anymore? It's, no, but if you just like skim through the news section in Google and look at all the article headlines, you might think that no one in the world is drinking alcohol anymore. And I promise you that's not the case. Yeah. And actually, I think no, that, consumption you know, itself is fine. Yeah. It's sure. Yeah. Anyway, I'll cut you off. Sorry. No, I, I understand. Yeah. I get it. There's the conversation. I've seen more around that conversation this year than I have in the last couple of years. It seemed like everyone was writing yeah. something either about dry January or just about the health benefits or detrimental characteristics of drinking alcohol. So. Yeah, really interesting. Yeah, totally. And me now is having this journalistic outlet, you know, the, with the Men's Journal Wine Channel. Like, of course, I'm writing about sober October and dry January because it's what people are Googling. But yeah. I'm not myself a teetotaler. I'm not drinking this month. I, no offense to anyone out there. I can write a dry January article and still have a glass of wine in my hand. It's okay. It's not against <laughs> the law. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm not telling everyone because we have this binge culture in America. I'm not saying drink every day for 11 months and take January off. That's ridiculous, you fucking people. What you should do is moderate your behavior throughout the year. That's the better option. But we all want things that are social media holiday reflective and that we want rhyming campaigns. And I get it. We're a marketing culture. It's an attention economy. It truly is. And of course, yeah. we all got to take advantage of that when we can. But me personally, like I don't drink at home alone. I don't drink all that much unless I'm traveling or maybe if I'm on a date or if I'm hanging out with buddies and we're like, I'm going to a wine dinner tonight. We're going to drink a lot of wine. It, that's okay. But like, I don't need to take a month off to then make up for my 11 months of being really drunk. Like, we, yeah. We've got to evaluate our behavior in the other 11 months too. Well, what are, when you are good, like, what are you bringing tonight to this wine dinner? What are you drinking when you are drinking these days? Maybe we can get into some of your. Yeah. Uh, sort of <laughs> deep dive you can impress us with a few like deep cuts and then maybe also give us some stuff that uh, some folks can pick up at their local shop too yeah totally so i just got back from a little trip to napa i got to go to the bella oaks vineyard which is a, a classic vineyard in rutherford area 
for years and years, the owners sold to Joe Heights. So they, there was a single vintage bottling, single, sorry, single vineyard bottling from the Heights estate for a long time. Bell Oaks has become its own standalone brand. And I've got a bottle of 2017 I'm going to bring tonight, which will be really good. I've also decided I'm going to bring, I got a 2020 Vincent Girardin Corton Charlemagne. I'm ready to pop. So I'm going to drink that. And I got some vintage champagne. I think I'm going to bring a bottle of 2012 L'Anson, which I'm a big fan of. And then there's going to be other wine too. And I'll probably bring three or four other things just to fuck with everyone. Maybe <laughs> Georgian skin contact wine, or I got some back vintage Austrian Riesling, something, something weird. Nice. How, what what would you say on the, on the weird front? I'm always looking for the newer, I guess what normal people would call weird, but I think they're just good. What, what are some of some things you're just into right now that maybe would be off the, the typical beaten path? Yeah, it's funny. Like these are wines that I've had to remind myself. Maybe I've known about them for 15 years, but not everyone drinks. But La Crema de Moro d'Alba. I've got a weird, and for those who aren't familiar, it's a, a weird grape that's grown in the Marque part of Italy. It tastes like roses, literally. And as it ages, it becomes a little bit less rosy, a little bit more kind of tar, almost like what well, you see how Nebbiolo ages. So I got a back vintage of producer for, I think from 2010. I've never tasted one that old. So I might mm -hmm. bring that and things like that I'm excited about. I drink a lot of, I like Cour Cheverny, so Romeron Tan, I'm a big fan of that. I like White Rioja, which doesn't seem that odd, but who drinks Vera? I like back vintage Viera personally. Yeah. I like to drink things like Muller Turgau or I like, I don't know. What are some other cool, like Schio Patino from Northeast mm -hmm. Italy. I'm going to be back up there hopefully not in April. So like from Friuli Colio area, like I don't know anyone who just pops Schio Patino unless they're a sommelier at an Italian restaurant in New York. Yep. Yep. Or just loves those random things. Uh, no, those are some great yeah. ones. Mm. Excuse me. Some great ones. Um, and we might have to talk offline about more specific recommendations because I'm yeah. curious. But on that front, I've also curious since you've had so many experiences with so many different like between the Som TV stuff. What are some of maybe one or two of the crazier tastings, whether it be like the company or you were just like, wow, this this flight is absolutely insane. Can you share a couple of stories like that? Do you mean like at a winery or, or somewhere on location? That it could be anything. Like basically like where, the, where you're just like, wow, I can't believe this like flight of wines are in front of me or the, the, these wines are here or it's wow, these people are. Yeah, it could be anything. But it's just like, what are some of the most memorable okay. tasting experiences? <clears throat> Excuse me. One opportunity I got to go to, this was in 2018, I want to say. It was Evan Goldstein and his company Full Circle up in San Francisco was doing their yearly conference and they had the winemaker from Bertani, <laughs> excuse me, Andrea, who's, I'm forgetting his last name, but he had, he was studying to become a master of wine and since has become one. He put together this retrospective tasting from their old Amarones, which I was never a fan of Amarone being real, but we got to try a bunch of Amarones back to, I think, 59 or 61 and it was like all the top vintages from all the decades in between. So that was an amazing wow. retrospective. Before he passed away, I got to do, I went one year to Aspen Food and Wine. And I briefly got to meet, Ser meet Serge from um, Chateau Musar, who I've since become friends with his oh, son, wow. Mark. Yeah. And so I got to try a bunch of back vintage Musar, red and white. I think the oldest we had there was like somewhere in the 70s. And what's funny about those bottles, like sometimes they're just perfect. And sometimes you can't tell if they're corked or not, or if there's just VA problems, but even when they might be corked, they're still weird and cool. So you just get through them and bottle to bottle, their variation is unreal, but the wines are so good. So I always loved old Musar and I've got a quarter Lebanese blood in me. So I've got to give love to my Lebanese brethren. That's always a fun one. And then let's see what else. Dave Gibbs one time let us taste a 19th century Bordeaux. We got to try, I think it was 1899 Lafitte. And that was pretty fucking crazy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but yeah, things like that. I don't know. I'm sure there's a lot that I've forgotten. I've forgotten it's a crazy. lot more than I remember. I hate to say. Where do you, do you think there's just like a certain place that someone not needs to be as your palate kind of evolves to be able to really appreciate vintage wine like you're talking about? 
vintage wine has become relatively unreachable. The prices are unreal now. It's yeah. really tough. So it, let's say that you, anyone out there, the proverbial you has the opportunity to buy a vintage bio, bottle from Napa or Bordeaux, or you got friends who have a deep cellar and they open stuff up and then you like want to go experience it again. Burns in Tampa, the steakhouse has a great old school wine list. They've been buying wine for seven decades and they've got a lot of them priced originally. Like they haven't changed prices on a lot of stuff. So making the, the homage, the kind of Mecca trip to Burns. I wish Augustine was still open. It had a fire. It looks like it will reopen at some point. They'll be back pouring vintage wine by the glass again. Vintage Napa, you can go up to press in Napa, but it's just, it's becoming mm -hmm. so unattainable for the normal person. So I think just scouring any sort of spectrum auctions, wine bid, places like that, where you can get access, try to get them as inexpensively as possible. And also what I've learned with vintage wine, this is a, a little thing I'll pass along to anyone listening who wants to get into it. The ones that are going to get everyone's attention, the ones that are expensive, the ones that like the 10 people will bid each other up on. Don't buy those obviously, because well, who can afford that? Look toward the other places that we maybe don't give the credence to like South Africa, Australia, Chile, Argentina, go for these wines. As long as they were stored well, wines from the seventies and eighties from these places might blow your mind and you might get them at a lower cost. That was something that really, that access blew me away when traveling helps because you get to try from the sellers, but we would take a risk on wines that you wouldn't traditionally think could have a 30 year, 40 year window and like old Stellenbosch Cabernets or even Syrah from the eighties. Like those wines live great. Those old Mirlust wines or... We bought a bunch of old, cool Grenaches and South Australia Cabernets. I'm forgetting producers, but obviously we found some old Penfolds and things. Those have a big market, so we're not getting those too cheap. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's real easy for us to write off anything that's quote unquote old because people think that wine can't age. But when you think about it, the determinants of aging are tannic structure, acid, and sweetness, sugar content, residual sugar. If a wine has two of the three of those, the likelihood of it aging a long time is a lot higher. High tannic varieties, wines made with a lot of acid, sweet wines, obviously. Just, t you know, take a flyer on some of these things that may be at a lower price point that aren't from the desirable locations or at least aren't where the collectors are looking. You might have the most mind-blowing bottle of wine you never expected from a locale you never considered. It's really, it's available to you. I think that more than anything, because like first growth Bordeaux and top, burgundies and it's out of most people's price range nowadays yeah on the other side of the conversation i think that there's probably a lot of folks who like when we talk about maybe napa the people wanting to drink old napa but then it's like probably not enough people actually drinking it young uh, that's the whole point of that style it seems like you gotta have like, a reference point fruit. too though yeah what's that like i've always said this to people the last couple years vintage wine better subjective it's yeah, the, right. the, the concept is having the reference point of you want to know, do I like the, what like, does. <laughs> if I have a current vintage yeah. Bordeaux and I like it, that's okay. I'm allowed to like it. But if I then try from the same Chateau, a 20 year bottling and I like it more, that's your answer. It's not, I can't answer sure. that for someone. They have yeah. to have the context of knowing, do I enjoy youthful wine or do I like it as it becomes more of a mature age thing? That's, I think, a detail that we lose. Some people will hear the hype of vintage wine, go buy wine, and they try, and they're like, well, I don't get it. This, it's not what I like. Because they like young, fresh, macerated, over-the-top, big, beautiful wines. And th there's nothing wrong with someone liking opulent. I'm not going to ever make someone feel bad about liking that. But they're not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, people put hard and fast rules. Of like, oh, you can't drink this until 10 years or something. It's weird. Yeah. It's funny, I'm, yeah. and, there, and there are folks like my fiance who she, whenever we have anything with a little bit of age, I'm thinking even just like maybe 15 years or a little bit more than that, she'll just say the wine tastes old. But on the other side, she loves some of these natural wines that have absolutely yeah, no they fruit. That. They're just completely <laughs> sa savory and saline. And it's at the same, I get you, how do you, and it's just interesting. It, it is, some of it is just an acquired taste. It's just like, what, what do you mean old? Cause I know you're not worried about fruit. 
But there's just certain things like some of these matterized notes or not matterized. I can't think of the word I'm thinking of right now. But basically, some of those old notes, I guess she's just a little turned off by. Who knows? Might be a color thing. Yeah, too. That's, that's fair. I feel you get some of these dark red wines and you expect Ron, it to Roncio, taste like dark. Roncio. Yeah. Not yeah. everyone likes it's it. That's okay. Notes, yeah. I, I, we learned this at Augustine. Like People would walk up and say, I've never had a 30-year-old wine. Is it good? And my answer would always be, there's one way to find out. Number one, because good is subjective. But if you like young, big, over-the-top red wines, if you love young Napa Cab and young Santa Barbara Pinot and young Paso Robles, whatever, vintage wine is a very different experience. Now, it doesn't mean you won't like it if you like those other wines, but if you prefer that fresh, lively, unctuous style, it is not the same thing. And mm -hmm. I never tried to force people to like it. It just was something we like to offer, obviously. And yeah, that Rancio style is, that's an acquired taste. That's not for everyone. People who like the more umami style things and enjoy forest floor to fresh fruit, like they're just different things. And I've always been very adventurous. Uh, I'll taste anything. I like to smell weird stuff. I'll lick rocks. I want to know what flowers taste like. I remember going body surfing and wiping out and swallowing the seawater and getting some sand in my mouth. And like those flavors, if you remember them and have the reference point for them, you can find them in wine, but not everyone thinks about it like that. And I think as people get more into their wine journey, a lot of times they'll be more open-minded to that stuff, but also they need to have an epiphany. Someone has to open it up to them. We don't always yeah. know it's okay to like weird shit. Some people just think, well, that's weird. So I don't like it or I won't like it. <laughs> I also, whatever you, you like you is said, okay. You said something earlier <clears throat> that it's very similar to my passion for wine too. It's like a love of history and geography. <clears throat> and I think if you, if you like those things, like for me, sometimes drinking an old bottle, even if it's not like exactly what I want it to taste like, I'm like, I just picturing the lifespan, like what that year was like when it was made and what it's gone yeah. through to get to where it is. Like that alone is enough for sometimes for me to appreciate it. I, I think it's easier to convince people who are into that type of stuff to be yeah. open-minded rather than just looking for a flavor experience. When we talk about historic bottles, like wines from the 1800s, wines from the early 1900s, from pre-prohibition, from pre-World War I, from World War II times, the way that I like to shape it and give people context on it, I don't evaluate whether they're good or not. That's not how I like to look at it. What I mm -hmm. like to say is, think of all the times that someone who held this bottle chose not to open it. Think of all those decisions that were made whether it was from a single family in one place or it got passed down, purchased, rebought, moved. Choices were made that let that wine get to you, number one. Number two, tasting history doesn't always taste whatever you think it's going to try or taste like. It might taste like mothballs. It might taste like old library books. It might taste literally like dirt or concrete or a brick. There is value to that. It's okay if it doesn't taste like fruit or it doesn't taste like, if you read some critics approach of a wine and their breakdown and what they say it tastes like, and you don't taste that, you're not wrong. A lot of times, and I, as someone who writes about wine now, I try my best to avoid it tastes like this because we all have our own experiences. We all have our own palates. We all have different Rolodexes of words and familiarity with what things do smell and taste like. My biggest thing I recommend people, and I've learned this from through the years with people who work in fragrance, the only way to know is to literally know what everything smells and tastes like, or you won't have the reference and the be able, the reality to, you can't recall it without that re reference to the Rolodex of terms and flavors and thought and smells. And you have to be able to make your brain kind of index those things to then say it tastes like whatever. And some of us have a bigger vocabulary and a bigger familiarity. Some of us haven't gotten there yet. It just takes time. It's a lifetime. We got a lifetime to do this. We're all still, cosmically speaking, we're fucking babies. We're not even born yeah. yet. Yeah, that really makes me think about some people who just tasted so many things, like like Michael Broadbent back in the day. Oh my like god, we, we, yeah, yeah. We've had his son on. We actually just replayed his episode. Um, he talked about Musar too. But yeah, it's like just imagine He's the importer. Like, yeah, yeah. When, when if you have tasted for that long and you're still sane at the end of your life and no dementia or anything. You must, like, that guy could comment on what things taste like. But yeah, most of us just still have decades and decades of learning to go. But uh, absolutely, no, I love that that perspective. I'm going to start saying that to people, at least to my fiance, when I open up an old bottle. Think of all the decisions that had to be made or not for us to drink this. 
Awesome. Well, I think that's a pretty great place to wrap it up here. Brady, is there anything else you really want to dive into real quick at the end of this episode? Yeah, I was, about to, I was about to say the same thing. I'm glad we got back around to the vintage wine stuff because I felt like we um, breezed past it. Uh, that was the concept of your that second location. And then I'm glad we got back around to it. So it was cool to hear about your perspective on it when you're drinking these days. That's been a, a focus for us. Like trends 2024, what are, like, what are we trying to drink in 2024? So older wine is going to be on that list too now. And champagne. Drink more champagne, champagne. guys. And yes... Drink sparkling wine from anywhere, but drink some fucking champagne. Just spend the extra 10 bucks. Drink some champagne. Just do it. Nike, just do it. You're going to be happy. <laughs> I love that. Nice. All right. Well, thank you so much for Thanks, joining us, Matt. Appreciate it. Great. Pleasure. Thank you guys for having me. What a great conversation. Really appreciate awesome. it. All right. That was our interview with Matthew Kaner, somebody I've really wanted to have on the podcast for a while now, one of my kind of local LA wine icons. So I hope everybody enjoyed that conversation as much as I did, because I know it was really entertaining for me. And yeah, that is our episode for this week. Stay tuned. We have another interview with the one and only Raj Parr next week. So stay tuned. Till then. Cheers. To check out our current offerings and to sign up for the Vint platform, find us at www.vint.co. That's www.vint.co. For questions, comments, or feedback on the Vint podcast, please email us at support at vint.co. Vint and VV Markets are offering securities pursuant to Regulation A. Our offering circular is amended can be found on the SEC website. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Investments such as those on the Vint platform are speculative and involve substantial risks to consider before investing. We may provide communication that may contain certain forward-looking statements that are subject to various risks and uncertainties. Information provided in any communications, including this podcast, is not legal, business, or tax advice. All prospective investors should consult a legal, tax, or business advisor concerning the subject matter of any communications and any offering.